Hunter Forbes joins us and explains how he was able to find his niche in recreational land sales and management in the Panhandle and Alabama. We hope you enjoy. In our Expert Opinion podcast is brought to you by SVN Saunders Ross and Danzler Real Estate, a full service land and commercial brokerage with over four billion in transactions since 1996. Okay, welcome back to In Our Expert Opinion podcast. Um, every time we do a virtual podcast, everything any, is perfect. Everything's great. Everything everything's is awesome. Perfect. Everything's perfect. Nothing ever goes wrong. Correct. Um, We're just, just going to manifest. Yeah, that. just yeah. once though. M- moving forward, that's just how it's going to be. Once, I'd like to walk into this situation. And everything to go the way that I want it to go. But I think that's been my whole life. Not to make it about me, but I am. Overcoming adversity. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Fight the adversity on the that's field. Right. I think Will Muschamp said that after a terrible game. But. Mm. Um, Were there any good ones? Yeah. Uh, Chad. I mean. Get into get, get into the SEC and we'll talk. Um, anyways, welcome back. We've got Chad. To my left, We've got Eli hopefully running technology. Sometimes he forgets to hit record and then we have to redo it. So are we good, Eli? We're good. That's great. Doing things. We're trying our best here. And then we have uh, Hunter, who is virtual, who is also doing his best. But on his side, I think everything was set up perfectly. <laughs> Flying a little blind over here. That's right. Um, hopefully you're not a pilot, though. <laughs> No, don't have that to worry about. <laughs> no, but you are a boat captain. I am. I and am I looked this morning because Eli told me that you have like 15,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few. Nothing crazy. How did that happen? Do you just posting fish pictures and every guy on earth was like, this is the best <laughs> Instagram ever? I think it was the hunting pictures that caught on there. <laughs> but no, I used to really promote that stuff. And was in you know tune with it for a while but you said y'all had a so I think had a lodge in Kentucky we did we so did. that was we that was a, where uh, most of the photos came from a lot of them did yeah I mean I kind of hunted all over and traveled a bunch so the pre-kid time period of my life mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I was a little better at gathering content than I am now but well you're kind of yeah. your parents kind of forced you into that lifestyle by naming you hunter right yeah, I got it pretty honest there for sure. Yeah, you definitely yeah. didn't have very many other like <laughs> avenues to go down. You're kind of just stuck to this one. <laughs> yeah, fits well though, at least. A hundred. Yeah, at least you like it, right? Absolutely. Okay, so you started out. You're you're first of all, let's say you're new to SRD. Um, you just came on as an agent, and I think that you were DM'd by a one Bryant piece. Yep, I sure was. He reached out to me uh, probably a year and a half ago or so, two years ago now, and uh, kind of courted me for a little while and eventually, you know, sounded like a better and better idea. And we had a meeting in person there and kind of hit it off. And yeah, ended up joining the team a little over a year ago. Yeah. How long long have you had your license? Was it just because of this conversation or you already had it or? No, I had my license probably six or seven years now. Okay. Um, It's been a little while. I was, I got it just to have it. I was building some spec homes at the time and thought it'd be a good idea and did a few residential sales and never really thought much because the area that I was from, that land sales would be such a thing. Mm -hmm. And little did I know, yeah, it's absolutely a thing and it's a niche market, but it's a, it's a good market. Yeah. I would actually think that we should mention too, that you are not located in central Florida. You are located uh, near the panhandle. Yep. I'm uh, I'm in Santa Rosa Beach. I'm yeah, up here in the panhandle, kind of off to myself and the rest of the team down there. But yeah, it's good. I mean, it's a good team, but maybe count your blessings. Sometimes it's best to just be alone. <laughs> no, no. But at least yeah. you can kind of get a stronghold on that market because I don't know that there are any other um, SVN. I, I don't know if there's an SVN office up there. I have no idea. No, there's not. Yeah. I actually kind of report back to the Thomasville office. That's the closest group of guys there. They're kind of the team that I'm with and do my meetings with and stuff. So 
great group of guys over there. I know SVN has a presence in Tallahassee. Um, I don't know if there's any other offices, but it's it's not one of our offices. Yeah. Um, but that might be the closest one to you. But yeah, yeah, probably so. But then also, so you're not just um, kind of working in the Panhandle. You also got your Alabama license. Yes, I do. Yep, which really for me, isn't that far of a drive though. I mean, an hour, hour and ten minutes, I'm at the line. So it's pretty common for the buyers down here to be looking across the line in Alabama as well. What are the advantages to that? Is it just because there's more land there or the type of land that they're looking for? Uh, well, you're kind of limited with how much land is here. Being on the coast, you can only drive one way to get to land. <laughs> that's north. <laughs> Once you get up that way, you know, it kind of spreads out a little bit better. So land's a touch cheaper across the line there in Alabama than what it is in Florida. Um, and it plays, yeah, to your, a- plays to your strength as well because you do land management and... You you That's don't right. you don't want to be running uh, condo associations on the beach. Doesn't <laughs> doesn't really strike me as what you would love to do. <laughs> no, not at all. You got to be careful using the land management term down here because yeah, most management companies has to do with the property, mm-hmm. with condos and HOAs and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of erosion there. Not a fun, not a fun time. Uh, okay, so you were doing you said spec homes for a while. Yes, I was. Okay. It was just simple one-offs. Um, yeah. You know, finding a lot, building a house on it and selling it just when the market was a little bit better for that. Yeah. I've slowed down since then, but it was a good reason to get my license and I had fun with it for a few years there. For sure. And it seems like kind of a natural transition, you know, if you're hunting or whatever it is to go into land, not commercial or residential, um, it probably just would suit your lifestyle better absolutely my hunting background runs very deep i mean from a young age um through college i started filming with tv shows and stuff got to travel to hunt and i always knew i wanted to have some kind of job within the outdoor industry it seemed like and me and my dad started a charter business right here in the area and kind of branched off from that to meet my wife and we started that lodge in western kentucky we ended up branching off into illinois as well and during our height there, we were probably managing and overseeing about 10,000 acres. Mm. So we did that for a number of years. And as many trail cameras you run in and all the relations you build with farmers and landowners and stuff, I mean, it was all just natural progression to end up being a land advisor and moving forward with the land management and stuff. It's once we decided to have a family, um, we sold our, our lodges in that business. And so now that's kind of, the you know, when Bryant found me, it was during that time and it just made sense for me to transition over to where I am now. Do you feel like that has helped you with client relations, managing expectations, having the lodge and, and doing the land management? Absolutely. You got to see all sides of it. Um, with this business and any business, it's all about who you know and people you meet along the way. And I've been very fortunate with that. Know a ton of folks and my name's gotten out there because of it. I really don't advertise this much and all, but I'm as busy as I want to be with it. And yeah, it's been really good to me. Good. Yeah. It, and so um, I, I just want to make this clear that you are going to be special at specializing in like hunting land. Rec. Rec. Yes. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Recreational hunting farms. <laughs> the killing fields, I should say. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and I just... You know, I I mentioned to you before, I've only been up to the Panhandle one time, but I just cannot imagine that there's like a ton of rec land, uh, not where I was at least, um, which was like, is it Alice Beach and Rosemary? Um, Can't imagine that there's a lot of that going on there. Yeah, you got to drive just a little bit, but there's plenty of it around and plenty of people that want to find that perfect place. Is it Um, it creeping north? I was about to say, is it creeping north of I-10 at this point? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, everything's moving north with developments and housing and stuff like that. So, yeah, everything's just progression is north for sure. The hustle and bustle of 30A in that whole area, you know, people need their escape and get away from it a little bit. So that's kind of where I step in. I've never been so out of place in my life, and I consider myself to be a refined person, but I was yeah. definitely out of place. Up there in this oh. podcast. Chad, I run this podcast. <laughs> Don't even go there. Um, 
Now, with the property management, I just kind of want to know how that all fits in. So are you your selling land, you're buying land, or you're representing, you know, those who do, and then you're taking over the management or you're, you know, you would like to uh, manage those properties that you have a hand in the transaction on. Yep. Like I said, it's a very niche market. Um, ideally, a buyer with me would, you know, we'd find a piece of ground and then they would hire me to sometimes just like on a consulting basis to help create a schedule with it, create a plan, do like quarterly site visits. Um, other folks, it's a little bit more hands-on. Um, I'm dealing with one right now, actually, the piece uh, sold back in February. And we've been clearing out we're probably around 40 acres of fields and food plots we put in. It's going to be a really nice dove field. And it's been every step of the way. So pretty much picking out what tractor and implements they need to what stands they're going to need come fall and really just making everything turnkey for them. So I can only take on a couple of those projects a year and the bulk of my business is through the, you know, consulting and just the site visits I'm doing with folks and helping, you know, get the properties from A to Z with where they want to be with it. Yeah. And what are most people I think looking to do, you know, after they buy a property? Um, I understand sellers, they're wanting to dispose of a certain asset, but then, you know, these buyers come in and what is it that they're looking for? Everyone's got different goals with what they like to do. Um, you know, what they like to hunt basically, or if they're trying to you know, get a little bit of income through timber. Um, every situation is really different, honestly. It's kind of hard to, you know, answer that specifically, but some people like deer, some like turkeys, and you know, some want to have a really nice dove field. And just going off of their thoughts and what they want to see the future of their place look like, it's kind of where I step in and help make that happen. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, what does that process look like? So you're consulting, you're maybe saying that they need to, I don't know, remove trees or? Yeah, you pretty much just got to figure out what they're lacking and what they need. So it's rarely, you know, in this area, at least you come across a farm that just has everything um, until we're done with it, at least. But right off the bat, usually they're really thick. So you got to open up areas. Some are too open. You got to replant some pines. It, it really just depends. Yeah. And so what do you think that the typical transaction is going to look like? Um, like, is it going to be 500 acres? Is it going to be 10? Um, are you, are they, are they like really large tracts of land or is it going to be sort of like the smaller, you know, below a hundred acres? Um, I'd say north of a hundred acres. So hundred to 500, I'd say it's kind of sweet spot on what mo most folks are finding. Um, it's hard to find tracks bigger than 500 acres. A lot of times, um, you typically have to put them together buying your neighbor's properties and stuff over time. But I'd say the 100 to 400 really is kind of where the, the sweet spot is there and what we're able to find mostly. Yeah, that's, and and I mean, not if, if somebody comes in wanting to buy 1,200 acres from you though, you're not gonna turn them down, right? No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely not. Like, it's just hard, oh, it's hard to come now. across those places. Yeah. You know, everything's kind of getting divided down and stuff. Uh, I'll find you something. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the larger tracks are going to be more feasible uh, over the state line in Alabama, which I would think, uh, I mean, but I don't know. I don't know that I've been to Alabama in the past 20 years. <laughs> right. He said, we'll, we'll go get you something up by Columbus. <laughs> Is that in Alabama? Yep. No, Georgia. Oh, okay. Georgia. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and so... <laughs> um, you know, whenever you're working on these properties that you're managing, are you more of like the boots on the ground or are you more of a general contractor? I mean, are you out there every day? Um, depends what we have going on, but no, not out there every day. It's more of, yes, the role of like a general contractor, hiring the subs in order to, like right now, the piece I mentioned earlier that closed in February, there's a lot of lane cleaners getting done on that piece right now. So, no, I'm not on the tractor, on the equipment, doing the work, but <laughs> hiring it out and making sure the job's getting done. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of my boots on the ground is early on. And like I said, I can make quarterly site visits for the most part and create the schedules and have everything in line with what they need going forward. And But you've been doing the land management for a while. I have. Like okay. I said, at one point, we were close to 10,000 acres I was looking after when we were having our lodge in Kentucky and Illinois. 
So it was it was a lot going on up there. It really was. So coming down here, it almost seems a little bit more tame. Um, not running around on a daily basis, you know, constantly checking farms and running cameras and all that. It's a little bit different. And cell cameras make it really nice. I try to monitor those for each of my, you know, landowners and clients I'm dealing with. Do you have to have certain designations in order to do that? Um, are there certain designations that, or classes that may help with that, but aren't required? Yeah, I try to read a lot and do as many little off classes that I can, but no, there's there's no, nothing specific with it. You now you got the people that go to schooling and tip my hat to them, the biologists and all the people with formal mm -hmm. education. That is not me. I was just boots on the ground. Like I said, I've been hunting from a really young age and doing it at a high level. I feel like with a lot of traveling and know a lot of the right people that have helped me get to where I am, but I don't have the formal education for it. School of hard knocks. Yep. That's right. So now whenever you have your fishing charter, I would think that, um, I mean, I don't fish, but I know that it can be a very expensive, um, I don't know that I want to call it a hobby. I think maybe people would get mad at me if I called it a hobby because it's taken pretty seriously. But I would think that a lot of the individuals who, um, you know, are into that level of fishing would also be interested in hunting. So are you getting clients that way? Yeah, for sure. Um, so kind of two parts of that. I have the inshore guide business with my dad. I don't run charters near as much as I used to, but it's been a great tool up until this point as far as meeting folks and finding those clients through that. You pretty much gather everyone in the Southeast that comes on vacation here. So you really never know who's going to be on your boat fishing with you. Um, here recently, I got back into the sport fishing and I am a captain on a private boat. I'm out of Sandestin here. It's a 56 foot Sunny Briggs. And we fish a lot of the tournaments and well, not a lot of tournaments, but a lot of fun fishing. A bulk of us in the summertime. We're offshore a, a fair amount, but it really goes nice with the with the land management and the real estate side of things because it is a lot of the same crossover clientele there. The folks that can afford the bigger sport fishing boats are typically the ones buying large pieces of land and the people like to fish, like to hunt and vice versa. So it does go hand in hand. Yeah, I would think that'd be a nice pool to choose from. Maybe I should get into fishing, but I feel like you got to have money woman. in order to, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. I'll talk. I'll think about that later. Definitely some expensive hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, I either have to sell more land or I, I don't know how that's going to happen. It might not. Um, OK, you're going to have to put it on your vision board because I don't yes. remember hearing that in January. No, no, that was not on my. No. Mm -hmm. um, maybe next year. Maybe next year. I, I guess I'll just have to track your uh, progress here at Saunders. And if you're selling these, you know, $18 million properties, I'm going to be like, that's the route I'm taking as well. <laughs> just coalesce with Hunter. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, now, you said that you just mentioned it, but um, you did some like TV shows, you said? Um, I used to film for some TV shows back in college, just for some hunting shows. Where did you go to college? Uh, I was at Auburn. Auburn. Very nice. Yeah. I think you may have mentioned that on Friday in our pre-interview and that one. Yeah, I was up there. Like I said, I didn't get my formal education. I started traveling and hunting a lot and I was, I was gone a lot on the road. So I was in entrepreneurship and I felt like I was doing a pretty good job of that anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, real, nothing, nothing beats real life experience, which I think, you know, is good for your clients, especially because they know that you're actively involved in that type of lifestyle and um, that you care, you know, so that you're going to take care of their properties the same way that they they would want to if they, you know, had the capabilities. Um, but I, I would, yep. you know, why is it important for landowners to hire a property manager like you? Oh, well, everyone's got their own goals and kind of ambitions with the property. Some folks are able to do a lot more of it themselves and have a deeper understanding with it. But a lot of people that are, you know, making money have their own jobs and kind of staying in their lane with it. It's easier for them to hire someone that has a good understanding. They can, you know, reach their goals quicker and just help keep them in line with it. So it's, I don't know, it's just a lot yeah. easier on folks, I feel like, to be able to hire that out and get get it done correctly saves a lot of time a lot of money and at the end of the day they're getting a good product out of it is they there a lot of competition 
I'm sorry, what was that? Is there a lot of competition in that field? Are there, I mean, are they shopping, mm -hmm. shopping you or they just know you and trust you and they say, hey, let's get it done? Yeah, there's really not a lot of competition at all. Um, there's not a lot of people doing this kind of work around this area. So most people that find me, it's word of mouth. So they kind of trust me from the get go with it. I'm happy to show anyone any of the farms I'm currently working on or anything I got going on. I'm an open book with it. They either want my service or they don't type deal. So yeah, and it's, it's been it, good though. It's got to be nice for that client relationship that they hear about what what you can do with land and what you've done in the past, and they come to you say, "Hey, we're gonna find something together. I'm gonna use you, and you'll be my agent. We'll buy the property. We'll do whatever with it. If if their goal is to, you know, turn something around and you know have something ready to sell in five seven years." or, you know, turn it into generational land, whatever their goal is, that whole life cycle is going to be with you. And then, yep. you know, if they do turn around to sell it, then who else better to list with? Because you've been there since day one on the property, you know, what's gone into it. And, you know, you're, you're walking sales flyer for it. So absolutely. A lot of what I do as well is plant dove fields, mm -hmm. help oversee dove fields. And I mean, what a perfect marketing tool for my business. You have, you know, one of my landowners has 20 of their friends out there, have a great hunt. Yep. Everyone, you know, has a blast with it. And into the hunt, someone's kind of, you know, sitting around like, hey, I, I think I want this, you know? So they, that's my testimonial right there. Like they just were on the hunt. We can duplicate mm -hmm. this on another piece. And so that turns into a land sale there and you just do it all over again. And so yeah. I've really been fortunate with the dove hunts. And, you know, planting those fields, it's been a great, great tool for me. Yeah, there's nothing like envy to make people spend money. That's the best, you know? <laughs> yeah, my my buddy's got one. one, yeah. <laughs> Keeping up with the Joneses, you know? It's like, yeah, you could have the same thing that this guy has, or you could go 100 acres bigger, and, like, it's so much better that way. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I think that's really great that you – it is like a walking real life testimony, you know, to the work that you do. And I think that's important for people to see because a lot of times with brokers um, or agents, you know, we don't, I don't like talk about necessarily my past transactions. Um, I certainly can, but it's not like I have um, this tangible like product right in front of me that I can say like, this is, you know, Look, look at what I did. It's just mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, maybe, you know, they just kind of have to go on my word. Yeah, you might have sold that building, um, but you have actual, right. like, it seems like product that you can show um, and that would like speak for you. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like that. I don't know. And I think that's one of the things that- <laughs> It's pretty straight to the point. Like, <laughs> you either like it or you don't. Yeah, it, yeah. It works. So. I, I think that that's one of the cool things about Saunders is being a- a full service brokerage is that you know sometimes you'll put a tenant or you know have a buyer buy a commercial piece of property and then they're like hey we gotta we gotta fill this space now and then that person comes in well we need we need to build out this to make this business work and you know you're may may hand them off to property management and then by the time that it's come to to sell that piece yeah you know property's filled the clients got what out, what they want out of it and their goals are accomplished and you know it's time to sell it and come back and we'll do it same yeah. way as his yeah for sure um okay so then this fishing charter i heard a, a story it's like so small this saunders world which i i had not heard of any of Dean, Gary, or Todd until I came to work here, until I came to interview here. But I was talking um, with Tyler Davis this morning, and he was saying that your dad took uh, he and one of his good friends out. This is like five or six years ago. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, it's a very small world. So even though you're like seven, six or seven hours away from us, there's still all of these little ties that bind. It's very... Um, do I get to hear Watch this story? Back. <laughs> they took the it's, dad took him out took them out fishing. Who? Tyler, Tyler Davis and David Hill. Oh. I think okay. his name is David Hill. I'm gonna be so embarrassed if it isn't. <laughs> no, it is. It is. Um it's crazy how connected fishing guides are. It really is. Like I said, everyone in the southeast vacations here. Everyone wants to come to 30A, the whole San Jose yes. Beach area. 
Yeah. And so just through that, I mean, during my peak when I was running, it was like three trips a day for five days a week throughout summertime. And you just say you average four people a trip. I mean, that's a lot of folks you're meeting. Mm -hmm. And all these are pretty well off individuals, you know, so you kind of meet people from everywhere and all walks of life there. So it's, it's pretty cool. Definitely well connected with, with those folks. I know. And then for you to be like DM'd by, you know, somebody at the company six years later, it's just very, you got to watch your back. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to have to call this a full circle podcast. I know. It always this is. episode. <laughs> um, okay. So then you are still, you, you said you're not really doing the charters anymore or not as no, many. I am, no, I am captain of the sport fishing boat though. So no, I don't don't actually do the charters as much in the bay, but I do fish offshore quite a bit. I absolutely love offshore fishing and it's going to be really hard to walk away from that, but not, well, fun. the time has not come yet for you to walk away from that. No, like I said, it's going to be hard to when that day comes, but <laughs> it's, uh, I really love it. We do a lot of bill fishing. So catching blue Marlins and white Marlin selfish, that's definitely a strong passion of mine, just like the deer and turkey hunting and dove hunting. So, yeah. Now, with these dove fields that you're planting, you know, I like hear all these people talk about these like dove shoots. What are, what are you guys like? How does that happen? Are you just throwing out seed? And these doves are just <laughs> what? Basically, no, it actually starts this time of year. Uh, Florida's dove season comes in September 28th this year, which is a little bit later than normal by about a week. But I'm starting to get field sprayed now and seeds can be going in the ground in about two weeks. Uh, we plant sunflowers, corn, millet, sesame, just a variety of things. You want to be diversified with it. And it's a lot of work that goes into it, but it's very rewarding when it comes through. And there's not a whole lot funner than, you know, it's kind of the start to hunting season, that first dove shoot mm -hmm. of the year. And so having a big group of guys together, normally it's a big cookout or something, eat a good meal, go out to the field and shoot. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I love entertaining folks. So that's kind of right up the alley, just, you know, encompasses all of it. And gets to you know show off all your hard work. I mean, but what are these fields? What makes them so like wonderful and special that these birds have to be on this field? <laughs> I said there's a lot that goes into it, but having a variety of things planted between the sunflowers, the corn, the millet, um, having a lot of bare dirt for them. Okay, you know, so it's like open in. space. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's it's to a T. Um, it's we not like woods hunting. Power lines. No, it's, I'd say the average field is around 15 acres. That 15 to 20 acres is about the right number. You can normally have about 20 folks on that size field. Um, we'll do the fake power lines. We'll sometimes put in a water source. Wait, water what? Travel. What do you mean you do <laughs> a fake power line? What? What are you talking Some, about? Somewhere for the birds to perch. They want to they yeah. eat, they want to drink. And what are, you, wanna, are you putting up like you, a 20? You got to keep them fat and happy. Yeah, we, we put up a fake power line, like right in the middle of the field. It it gives you an easy way to be able to get bird numbers, like before a hunt. You can count them on there. It also gives them a spot to, yeah, be kind of centralized on the field there, more shooting opportunities. So a lot of guys down here, like hunting in a place, uh, at a place in Ona, and they'll do it in between two orange grove rows. And yeah. they'll, plant, they'll plant their field down it, and then guys will set buckets in between old burnout orange trees and then the birds will come in they'll perch on the trees hop down graze a little bit what's in the bucket that's your seat <laughs> oh anyway <laughs> drop your set shells in there <laughs> i don't know maybe, maybe a, a snack whatever you want yeah <laughs> maybe, maybe an adult beverage for after the <laughs> after the shoot's oh done oh my god okay so but that's what you really like is these is is managing these dove fields and kind of getting those set up yep okay so that's going to be is. like your do you think that's like your number one it yeah because it normally is harder for people to understand how it all works i guess I, my most common questions are around dove fields there's so many different herbicides that you have to you know possibly use and so many different ways to do it so people like to come to me like okay just what's the answer like Yes, and people you get 10 different opinions, but you've been there, you've done that with it. How do I need to do it? And so I feel like it is a very common question with me and kind of my consulting is around dove fields. Okay. So you have to which, give you have to give up all kinds of hunting except for one. Which one are you keeping? 
That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I get asked that quite often. So, and I, the easiest way for me to do it is like, what could I wake up 30 days in a row to do? And it's probably going to be turkey hunting. Like, absolutely love to turkey hunt. I hardly miss a day in the spring. It's uh, it's definitely probably my favorite. All right, so your Mount Rushmore then. But let's hear the top four. Uh, well, turkey I mean, number one. The deer, the turkeys, the doves, and blue marlin. If that counts. Awesome. I don't. I'm not gonna keep doing this podcast anymore. I can't hear <laughs> one more. Thing. <laughs> I can't. You know what? It's because I don't participate. You know what I mean? Like I don't. My dad tried when I was really young to like. You know, I, I, he puts me in this tree stand, and I just kept saying like, I don't want to be here. And he was like, you're fine, like you're fine. This man came back four hours later and I was like, probably in tears. Anyways, it's because I don't participate, but I, it's like, I now learn so much about it, but what good does it do me? I don't know. Hey. Same thing with the- um, well, now, now you can get your bucket together. Jeez. Be ready. <laughs> She's gonna have her pink Yeti bucket out I'm there. I'm gonna have to have like someone else <laughs> take it out there for me because I'm gonna have so many snacks in there, but. <laughs> um, okay, so we just want to end kind of with maybe like a funny story. And we were talking a little bit earlier, um, you know, like everybody, you meet Dean. And the first time that I met Dean, I think I was like kind of mean to him. I know I was. And that's probably going to be the only time I'm allowed to do that. But that was because I didn't know him. Um, <laughs> but I think that you also had a kind of an interesting run in with him. Yeah, so I had to meet Dean um, at a lunch meeting that Bryant set up over in Tallahassee when I was getting brought on. And I drove over to Tallahassee. I was, you know, I showed up a little bit early. And so I went over to Kevin's, the sporting goods store there, and I was really wanting a nice pair of boots. And I went into Kevin's, and there's another gentleman looking at the exact same boot. And it was down to like, he had my size basically. And I, uh, it was the last one left. And he tried it on, and he was kind of him hauling. And like, I really want that pair. And we talked for a little while, and I ended up buying the boots. And I went over to the lunch meeting. I was sitting there and talking with Bryant. And I looked up, and here comes the guy that I was just looking at boots with. And I didn't know what Dean looked like. And it turned out that, that was Dean. So it was pretty funny. Little encounter. I love yeah. that you got to buy something out from underneath of Dean. Like, really <laughs> kind of one of him. That's a really strong, like, you know, first foot to put forward. He, you know, if he wanted them, he could have had them. But yeah, he's. <laughs> Wasn't quite what he was looking for, I don't think. So I love it. I love it. Uh, well, Chad, do you have? Uh, well, actually, no. I want to know how people can contact you. Like, I know you have fifteen thousand Instagram followers. So, are you answering every <laughs> single message that you get? Yeah, Instagram's a great, great way. Um, it's a way that people can kind of keep up to. I need to do a better job posting and keeping up with my stuff, but I'm going to start here soon. I mean, listen, I think you're doing okay. Pictures. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can definitely show a little bit more of my day to day of what's going on. So I plan on doing that. Like I said, people really like seeing before and afters and you know, we're getting busy in the dove fields now here soon. So we'll be able to show that stuff a little bit better. I'd love so to Instagram's a great way or just give me a call. Yeah, I'd love to see a picture of a fake power line actually. Maybe how what maybe how you do that. Uh okay, so Instagram I think there's one on there. <laughs> Is there really? I looked through. I'll have yeah. to look through again. Uh so Instagram or your email, which is Yep. Hunter.forbes at SPN.com. Perfect. Okay. Anything yeah. else, Chad? No, I think I'm good. Hunter, anything else to add? I don't think so. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you so fun. much. And obviously, if you're ever in Lakeland, let us know. Come see us. We got a Absolutely. boot store. <laughs> That'll probably be the only reason I'll come to Lakeland. So. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> All, right, All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. <laughs>